Uh, my name is Robert Furlong. That's F-U-R-L-O-N-G. When the war started in December of 41, uh, I had always been interested in aviation and airplanes, and uh, I decided then, if I possibly could, to get into a flying position. And uh, I joined the aviation cadets in May of 1942, and I had to wait until November of 42 when I got called up to uh, start in my flying program. And uh, the first place I was assigned to was Atlantic City. After a while, we were sent, I was sent to uh, Norwich University in Northfield, Vermont. And again, it was a series of ground training. And then we went from Northfield, Vermont to Nashville, Tennessee, where they tried to figure out whether you were going to be a pilot, bombardier, or navigator. And uh, at that point, after about two months, uh, I was assigned to flying training as a pilot. And the first place I was sent to was Avon Park, Florida, and we were flying Stearman PT-17s, primary trainers, and uh, we spent, we tried to get 70 hours. You had three schools. You started in primary, the second school was basic, the third school was advanced. In each school you were supposed to get 70 hours of training, but of course it was off by maybe four or five, usually on the heavy side because of bad weather. And we, uh, in primary, we learned to, uh, well, number one, we soloed so that we uh, actually, uh, and we did the beginning of aerobatics. We did uh, spins and stalls and that, that sort of stuff. Uh, we didn't do any cross country at that point. The second school we went to that I was assigned to was uh, Cochrane Field in Macon, Georgia. And there we flew Volte Valiance, BT, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, BT-13s. That means basic trainer, 13. And there we did more advanced aerobatics. We started cross country. We did a little night flying. And uh, the third school we started at was uh, advanced single engine in AT-6s. And uh, again, another 70-hour regimen. And uh, we uh, did a lot of night flying, a lot of uh, starting. Uh, we started a little uh, a gunnery, but very little down at Eglin Field, Florida. And at that point, uh, we were assigned to fly P-40s. We did uh, 10 hours in P-40s. And I happened to shoot a big gunnery score. And uh, so I was made a gunnery instructor down at, at, uh, at Eglin Field. And then I was sent back to the advanced school that I was at, at Dothan, Alabama called Napier Field, and there we flew AT-6s, and I was uh, an instructor. One day they had a notice on the board that uh, anybody wanted to volunteer. We had particularly, we have some openings for particularly hazardous duty in a cold, wet, and windy climate. I didn't know what it was, but I signed it. Suddenly I was on a ship and going over to Scotland. <laughs> I wound up in a P-47 Thunderbolt squadron. I wound up in the 53rd Fighter Squadron of the 36th Fighter Group of the 9th Air Force. We had some uh, harrowing times, of course. We mostly did ground support. We mostly did uh, low-level uh, attacks on tanks and trucks locomotives, 
troops, airfields. Uh, we shot at all the time. One thing we were not were escort pilots where we would fly for five or six hours and other than heavy flak, which we could get away from as fighter pilots and the poor bombers had to drive through, we were always getting shot at. And of course, we were in, uh, I started flying originally out of, uh, a little bit out of Epernay in France. And then we went to uh, Louvain, Belgium. That's where our field was, which was a former Luftwaffe, Luftwaffe fighter field. And uh, that was just before the bulge or the battle at the Ardennes. And we got into that and we lost a lot of guys. We, we started the beginning of that uh, particular battle, uh, which started on the 16th of December in 1944. And we had 33, I, I'm not sure whether we had 33 or 35 pilots in the squadron at the time. And between the 16th of December and the 1st of January, we had 19 pilots left. So uh, we had fairly heavy losses in the Ardennes campaign. And then uh, towards the end of the war, as the Germans were getting pushed back by the Russians and the Americans were coming in, the Luftwaffe still had plenty of airplanes. They were short on fuel, but they, uh, they were getting pushed back to fields that they could defend better than the fields they were on out in the hinterlands. So one of the most successful missions we ever had was on the 17th of April in 1945. In that particular mission, we had th three flights, and uh, we originally uh, were attacking some locomotives or trains, and uh, the uh, Luftwaffe, or some guys, some, we got bounced by some FW-190s, and we started a little battle with them, and then we actually turned east to get away from them because they were above us, and we ran across a German airfield, which was packed with German airplanes. So we had a big scramble with them, big fight. We shot down, a, I think, 10 of them uh, confirmed, and I think there was nine others that uh, were severely crippled. We lost uh, two airplanes and no pilots. One of the airplanes that was shot down was mine. I got badly hit by ground fire, and uh, it was oil all over the canopy, uh, very difficult to see out of the airplane. And I turned west away from the field um, and went to, uh, kept flying west. And I was looking for a place to get the thing down. And I wasn't sure where the line was. I wasn't sure where the American line was. So I kept flying and finally I saw a, uh, a little field, an evacuation field, a field like a MASH hospital. In other words, a forward advanced uh, hospital. And uh, there were little planes taking off and I could see that they had American stars on the wings. So I, I took the airplane and tried to get it down on their short little runway. <laughs> The P-47 lands at about 135 miles an hour, and they landed at about 40 miles an hour, and they just practically made the end of their, their runway. So I stuck the thing down as early on the runway as I could, just came in over some little low bushes, banged it on the runway, and I kept rolling and rolling, went into a woods beyond the, the end of the field, and the trees were going tick, 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 and they were pretty big trees. And it knocked the hell out of the airplane. So anyway, that was the end of that mission. And it was right toward the end of the war. It was the last big fight we had. But um, it got us, our particular group, that got us our second, uh, what do they call it, group citation. Uh, 
which was very, very good. They had gotten one before when they were up around Carantan. So, uh, so the war ended as far as I was concerned, and I, I was home in uh, late December 1945. And I went ahead and did 73 missions, and uh, I was lucky. I could walk out of airplanes at the end of the war, and I was still alive. My name is Paul Colangelo. I was born in Pagentro, Italy. It's a small town near Rome, a couple hours away from Rome. I came to this country when I was 14 to join my father. My father was here all by himself, and I came to this country to join my father. My father thought I was big enough to put me to work. Instead, he sent me to school. I was drafted uh, in um, November 1942. After the draft, they sent me to Camp Upton, Long Island, and from there I was sent to Camp Hood, Texas. Then we were sent to the Desert Maneuvers, where we joined the 4th Armored Division, uh, the, the Desert Maneuvers. And we spent about five, six months on the death of maneuvers because they would think that probably we had to go to Africa to fight, to, to fight in Africa. And from there, we went to Boston Harbor. And this, in February, I believe it was February 28th, we boarded this British ship, the, the Britannic, and uh, we landed in Liverpool, England. In fact, there's a big, big convoy going across at the time. We had about two to 3,000 ships convoying, including battleship, aircraft carrier, destroyers. And when we got to Liverpool, then we rode all night long to where we were in England, the Torbridge, England. This was 1944. In uh, July, after the D-Day, the, the invasion of Normandy, we bought in the Southampton, England, we bought the, an LSTs, what they call LSTs. We carried all the guns and the tanks and, and everything. And we landed in uh, Utah Beach, Normandy, at night. And then we established, we said, the beachhead over the beachhead. In fact, they were only about three, four miles inland when we landed in Normandy. And in fact, we were there at night. In the morning at daybreak, and you could smell the human, you could smell the human flesh, the animals at the time, because all the, the Killing and all the dead bodies over there. And I, I would see that a lot of dead bodies, so even part of the humans being legs up in the trees and all that. It, it's an horrible, horrible sight, a horrible smell at the, the time over there. In Normandy, well, of course, I was assistant driver of the tank, assistant driver, but at Normandy, and then what we did, we, uh, we, um, used our tanks, our guns, like artillery pieces, you know, shooting, because we, we were getting a lot of German uh, artillery shells coming towards us. So we, um, <clears throat> then, uh, after a couple of weeks, and they told us to pull back, pull back, pull back, and I said, what are you gonna do, back in the water again? So we pulled back, then the planes, about 3,000 planes came and kept bombing in the front of, front of us, the front line. And we took almost all day bombing. Then after that, after the bombing, then we took off, we took the advance. Then we, start, we started to move 
In fact, we got to this town, uh, the Avranches, the name of the town in, in Normandy. We captured 200 German prisoners ourselves. My company, my battery, we captured 200 prisoners. And then we spent almost <laughs> all, all the fall, the whole fall over there, this particular Metz, St. Nancy, that's the name of the town that we were gone. And then uh, uh, during that time, the Germans made a, were trying to make a big counterattack towards us. I remember early in the morning, about six o'clock in the morning, we were awakened. And uh, to, they said, mount up, let's mount up, let's mount up. So we mount up in the tanks. We started to move up the four of us tank, the third battalion of the C Company of the 704. We, I was in the third battalion. And we started to go up to Sill. In fact, my tank was the fourth one. All of a sudden, up in the front was very foggy. You could even see a hand of us in the front of us at the top. And we heard gunshot, boom, boom, boom. And one of our tanks coming back was damaged. In fact, he had two men killed and one wounded in that tank. And when we kept them going up, and we found two German tanks burning. And At the second end, there was a second tank. Again, we heard the shots, boom, boom, boom. Second tank came back. He was damaged. And again, as we kept coming, like I said, the fo very foggy, couldn't see nothing. All we could see the smoke and the fire. We, two more German tanks were hit. So then we kept it going up. And then we got two tanks left. We kept on going up this hill and go up to the top, and top of that hill. Then the fog started to clear. Then from the distance, we saw a big line of German tanks, like tanks, a big line of tanks. And we didn't even know if they were there were ours or they were Germans. But at the time, the, our guns, we didn't, what they call the buzzer blast in the front of the tank. The German had the German started with his muzzle blast. We didn't have it. My time, we didn't have the muzzle blast at the time in the front. So the troon, looking through the binoculars, we saw this muzzle blast in front of the tank, in the front of the gun. Then we realized that, that they were German. Then we started to open the fire, and you were having a, a real field day. We knocked them out. We move. We fire, fire, move, fire, and move. And we knocked out all together. At the end of the battle, we knocked, we destroyed 18 German tanks. And we lost three tanks. One was mine. And the reason why my mine was lost was because there was one German tank very well protected from this distance, and this, uh, the uh, platoon commander, Lieutenant Lieber, this, he, said, he wanted to get that tank the worst way. He wanted to get, you know, he insisted that he should get that tank. And that I had to go to the bathroom so badly, I had to go so badly that I couldn't wait. I couldn't. So I got off the tank, to do my business there, and they went up this hill without me. As soon as they got up that hill, boom, my tank got hit. And where did it get hit? Right where I was sitting, in the driver's side, the sister driver's seat. That's where the tank got hit. And thank God I wasn't in there. So God was with me that day, thank God. I got a three-day pass to, do, to go to Paris. And when I came back from the pass, I couldn't find my outfit. After I found my outfit, they, they were getting ready to go to the Battle of the Bulge in Belgium. Um, so uh, we mount up, we rode all night long through Luxembourg and Belgium to Bastogne. 
where the 101st Airborne Division was trapped. So the 4th Army Division, General Patton, of course, General Patton's Army, we moved up to Bastogne and to, in order to save this uh, 101st Airborne Division. So then we had big, big battles over there. In fact, before we got there, I believe it was 106 infantry division was almost 90% destroyed by the Germans, but the big counterattack that they made. And, uh, and during, in fact, it was Christmas Day, 1945, Christmas Day. The airplanes, the gliders, throwing supplies to the 101st Airborne Division that was trapped there, throwing the supplies. Until we broke out the ring, we broke out the run, and they, then we got the Germans on the run. From then on, we got the Germans on the run. And uh, like I, then we just kept them moving, moving, moving. Like I said, destroying you know, everything was gone. Then the, the the Germans were surrounding by the by the thousands. They were surrounding to us. Um, so we kept on moving. In fact, we were near. Uh, we were about 60, 70 miles away from Berlin, and General Patton wanted to go to Berlin. But they insisted they let the Russians go to Berlin instead of the, uh, the General Patton, the American uh, General Patton. So then uh, from there on, we wound up uh, in Czechoslovakia. What were we, were we going to Czechoslovakia? We heard over the radio that the Germans had surrendered. On the, on the way, <clears throat> There was this town, Herford, remember Herford, Germany, and uh, and it was a concentration camp. Um, Gotha, the name of the town, Gotha and Herford. We liberated this concentration camp in Gotha. Then there, were, then it was this in this town, Herford. We saw bodies, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of bodies into this ravine, lined ravine, the skin, skin and bones. For this. We, in fact, we went around, took, went around the city there. We got some the civilians, we put them on the trucks, and to show them what Hitler was doing there. And in fact, the, even the civilians themselves, the German civilians, were really surprised to see that kind of a sight. Yeah. After the war, <clears throat> they put us in uh, German barracks. Uh, Lenschot was the name of the town, Lenschot. There, I could have gotten a, a week pass to go to Italy. But then there was a time Permit that uh, my outfit was coming home. In fact, I even wrote to my sister. I had a sister there in Italy. I wrote to my sister that I was going to go and visit her from Germany. By the time came, all my outfits were coming home. So then I decided, I went to my company.